Cullen of the Rebellion. This was a tiny village. Scattered shelters stood along a zigzag river. They were built by refugees. The shelters were askew and ugly, but warmth was guaranteed. The tenants did not care for any artistic look, which was a nobility thing in their village. This place was so small, small enough that the landlord didn't even bother to give it a name. Speaking of which, all kids here have heard of him. He lived in a high castle and was free to do whatever he liked. He needs dozens of men carry to bed before sleep, and he can devour a whole pit for just one meal, though no one paid particular attention to it. This was the place Moya Jr. was born. Moya Jr. was the son of old Moya. Naming a child was not worth concerning for the villagers. Thus they put a junior in front of their old man. When a father dies, the sons will lose the junior. And when they father a child, they become the old man again. Simple enough. But Moya had a younger brother who had post old. Moya a naming problem. Then a knight who passed by gave him an idea. Call him Jack. Jack is an ancient hero's name. The knight suggested it can't be wrong. Old Moya had never dreamed his son to become a hero. Nevertheless, he believed in a knight's wisdom. Hero or not, feeding him wouldn't a problem, he guessed. Then Moya Jr.'s brother was named Jack. By the time Moya was strong enough to carry Jack up on the hill, winter has come. They said the Lord Masters love snow. They would enjoy their wine while worshipping the God of Light. But the snow wasn't a good friend to the poor. Now old Moya was currently leaning by the door anxiously. Moya was rather strong instead of old. He's strong enough to carry three bags of wheat around. He had half cake stored at home, which could feed to more meals if he rationed. Moya Jr. was big enough to wear his clothes, so he settled. What about Jack? Old Moya can't let him wear barks. Hey! Old Moya, Ivory the neighbor, who was a tall orc, stamped nearer. What's troubling you? My son's winter clothes. Old Moya said, Well, let me see. Ivory sat down and began thinking the same thing. Fishing season is coming. I can't let the kids go without a jacket, Moya said. What a freezing day. I got it. Ivory shanked. Remember the barn that we cleaned? I had found a rag in it. That old Moya stood up. I didn't notice that, but we could use that rag. So the kids won't be frozen, Ivory said. And perhaps there could be. Leftover wheat, yeah, old Moya said with a hint of a smile. Lord Master doesn't need them anyway. That afternoon, old Moya got that rag in hand and went to the neighborhood town. There was an old lady who knew needlework, two jackets for the kids in exchange for a piece of deer meat. That lady was so nice to put enough dry grass into the jacket, which could keep warm. Old Moya wanted to say something thankful, but he didn't know how. He blamed himself, seeing Moya Jr. and Jack playing. With their clothes on, old Moya felt relieved. The dry grass had made their clothes thicken, which looked warm. He considered that he has kept the kids well, as he promised to their mother. Who died right after their birth, without saying a word? Moya, Ivory urged, hurry up, fishing time, coming. Old Moya answered and gathered his nets and sticks while shouted to his kids. Young Moya striped a rope around his waist and Jack's waist on the other end. This way he wouldn't lose Jack, his. Father had told him he'd die if little Moya lost his brother. He would sell him and marry another woman. No Uncle Ivory can't stress enough that his father was intimidating him. Who would wait to sell any son until another son was lost? But Moya. Junior took it seriously. He never let Jack go anywhere beyond his sight. Even during sleep, he held arms around his brother. In winter times, ice fishing was a big deal. This ain't no work that could be carried out by a dozen people. Usually, it had to. Take men of the whole village. They needed to make holes on the lake and sink the net which was borrowed from the lords. Then they had to drag the net to the other end of the lake. The lords would certainly come to see this winter activity by Carriage or sleds, they wore luxury fur and leather and had their servants make fire by the lake. Like a show, they watched the village men hunt for fish. The lords talked and laughed. And their sons and daughters would wow and pick the fish they 
Like ant habits slaughtered for barbecue, if the fishermen do well to please their lord masters, then there would be plenty of fish left dedicated for winter as a reward. Moya Jr. and Jack watched while old Moya was digging holes on the lake. Fish. Big fish, Jack was copying his father's movement and smashed his wooden stick on the ice. I wanna eat you. Come out. Little Moya blew his nose, then noticed the imminent arrival of the lords. Several servants began unloading their carriage and, placing them by the lake, Moya stopped looking at them. He was aware that staring at the lords was not right. They might get angry just by being washed by commoners. Men were dropping nets. Little Moya was excited to expect some meat. He hated to run after Jack every time he got excited at anything that moves. It was blowing an average snow. Men were dropping and tracing nets one more time. The pile of fish was growing larger and larger. Little Moya, along with his brother and a bunch of other kids were watching aside. Kids from the village were not different at all. They wiped their nose and drooled. Their eyes were as green as hungry wolves. Men carried baskets of fish and dumped them on the ground. The alive and kicking fishes slipped everywhere, half playing, half helping. The kids kicked the fish within a circle. Why kick? That way meant you are not stealing. Little Moya was kicking fish and noticed one that was rather small. He stepped on it when no one saw him and moved it far from people. Then he pretended to play with Jack while dragging him around. Brother, Jack asked, are we finished? No, kick, kick, Moya whispered, open your mouth. Then he confirmed again there was no one around and grabbed a small fish. Using his fingernail, he cut the fish belly and pushed all that's inside out, then threw the fish into Jack's mouth. Ah, Jack popped his chest. Cool, jump, Moya said. Jump and the cold will go away. They were jumping on the ice. Until a butler stopped them and brought them to the Lord Master, my lord. Butler said, look at these bastards. Look, they made their clothes out of your barn curtain. Curtain. The landlord asked, what curtain, master? It's the curtain from the barn. The man said, fine linen, with your stamp on it. They stole it. To commoners, kids, not a big deal. Lord said, get out. Didn't you see, my lord? The butler said, there was a lord master from the south. Who's as kind as you, then? Those jackasses robbed him. I heard people died during the uprise. You must not indulge them, my lord. Last time when the priest came, he mentioned that this year will be rough. You should be careful of the commoners. While the butler was talking to the Lord Master, little Moya held Jack tightly unaware of what was going to happen. He can't do anything about it even something were to happen. That night, while old Moya was making smoked fish, the Lord Master had him and Ivory tied away. The night was too dark for little Moya to run after them, and Jack was too young to catch up while there were wolves in the field by night. The next morning, Little Moya dragged Jack and ran towards the Lord's castle. They slipped and fell so many times. Black and blue, but they persisted without knowing the pain. Both of them knew everything will work out once they see their father. As they approached the castle, Little Moya lowered Jack's head and started tearing. He saw Uncle Ivory's body hanged up on the castle gate. They found old Moya lying outside the gate. Snow was yet to cover his wrinkled face and his arms have disappeared. Blood was all over the ground. Dad, Dad. Little Moya tried to wake him. Old Moya opened his eyes and stared at his. Children trembled. Don't cry. He tried so hard to hide the broken arms underneath. Moya, Jack, look away. Little Moya tore and covered his little brother's eyes. Remember the fish I made last night? Old Moya asked. His son nodded. I counted them 30 to fish. Go, good. Moya smiled sadly. Go home, take the fish, and run. Take your brother. Little Moya cried and shook his head. He didn't want to lose his father. I, I can't walk. Old Moya said, promise me, Moya, take care of your brother. And remember, old Moya said again, run to the south. Keep warm. Walk along the river. You'll have food. I can catch fish, moles. I will feed Jack. Good, remember. We owe that lady a dear. 
Remember, having said that, Moya lost. Lights in his eyes, go, leave me, don't let Jack see me. Little Moya knew that his father never changes his decision. Step by step, he walked backward, hands covered his brother's eyes. As they returned home, little Moya packed all of the smoked fish and roped his brother. They were ready to run. Then he turned back and looked around thinking he needed to at least carry a weapon. There were nothing except for bare walls in their home. So he packed another wood stick. They left Moya Jr. No, they will be starved to death if they don't run. When Moya Jr. and Jack once again crossed the castle, people started to call him Moya. Someone told him. His father's body was thrown to God knows where. Hearing this, he felt pain and knew he had to hold back tears. He carried his brother and walked, walked. He needed to leave this place and travel afar. He's never coming back here again. Moya has been growing. So has his brother. They both required more food, thus they kept traveling and search for warm places. Moya will find any food for his brother. The rope between the two had gone. They could run fast this way Jack had learned how to follow his elder brother. Now the brothers knew where they were without even talking to each. Other Moya sharpened that stick for Jack and found himself a bigger one made of metal. He begged for a blacksmith to sharpen both ends. Don't underestimate that stick. He had killed a wolf with it. And Jack's stick killed countless fish. The two. Brother fed their way traveling through mountains and rivers, from land to land, until they met their first leader. That day, Moya and Jack caught an animal, ate its meat. The creature's skin looked fine, but they had no idea how to tan it. They kept. Walking then, a small town appeared on the horizon. It was their lucky day. A piece of beast skin for a piece of cake. Yummy Moya sniffed, then passed it under Jack's nose, right? Yeah. Jack asked, is it our dinner? Nope, we are not having. This tonight, hardship had made Moya careful on rationalization. This cake will last for long. It could wait until you feel hungry. And okay, Jack was smart. He never asked too much. Let's find a mole. They walked out of town while talking, then. Moya discovered that the cake was gone. Cake's gone. This was big. Moya got all sweaty. That guy who bumped into you earlier. Jack reminded, perhaps, right. Moya held his cane and started to search for that guy who's about the same age. Finally, they found that boy around a corner. However, the cake was already swallowed down. Cake, I ate it. You can't take it back even you kill me. The boy who named Marfa clapped his hands. Are you hungry? Follow me. Moya got speechless. Marfa told Jack to stand around a food store. Just stand there and look at the owner. If you were a store owner and spotted a boy stared at your food with eyes green, what would you do? Of course, you'll have other affairs to attend, but you need to keep looking at the boy in case he moved. Jack froze there for a while and left because Marfa tucked a sizable of food in his jacket in order to stay full. They did it many times. They then knew Marfa's an expert by looking at his movements, searching. For food has become easier with three kids working together. While they were at roughly the same age and got along, they became inseparable. Marfa was the most cunning one. Jack was pretty good at it though he's too young. Then Marfa becomes the boss. Then the three wandered about and traveled to the south. Whenever they reached a city, then Marfa will plot a theft for food. Then they run away to the field or along the river and lead a few days hunting. Things went well like this, however. One day, they met another orphan. He was strong, stronger than Moya, gray-haired and nose crooked, looked tough. But they have to be tough on him because they have trouble on the attribution of a wild rabbit. Moya spotted it. Jack hit it with a rock. Then it was killed by the gray hair anyway. So they argued. We saw it first, Marfa said. It belongs to us. Nice one. You saw it, then you own it. Who taught you that? The kid looked down. I saw you and should I own you? Whatever. Give it. Back, Moy is a bit annoyed after being starved for a whole day. We'll beat your ass if you don't. My ass, Moya didn't expect that boy was this fast. Before he's ready to fight and got hit in the face, seeing his brother being beaten, Jack rushed.
forward and grasped the gray hair's legs. Marfa kicked his ass, for boys fought, until they were exhausted. Then they continued their argument. How about, Marfa said, we share, okay. That boy said, half and half. No, Moe shouted, we are. Three, you are only one, so what, you want to fight again? Yeah, nobody's gonna be full of splitting it into four. I don't care, Jack said, I'm hungry, aren't you, burn it. Since all kids are hungry, then they called a truce, while preparing. Maya sighted another rabbit and it ain't wait for no one. Everybody rushed out except for Jack who was setting the fire, for these kids. Rabbit chasing required cooperation and it wasn't an easy job, since the three were cooperating. They listened too, the gray-haired, because he looked like a veteran. It took a while for them to catch the rabbit. In the meanwhile, an extra rabbit brought them a chance to settle down peacefully. Not weird at all. Kids were able to become friends easily. Half rabbit. For each child, everybody's happy. I'm wilder. I'm alone. The gray-haired introduced himself. Yourself. Moya said something about themselves. Because then we're wanderers. Sticking together seemed to be a good idea. Wilder was a hunter's son and... He hunted since a boy, only one day. His old man disappeared after going out on the market. Then Wilder went out. Wilder had the nerve to do what other people don't, and he's not afraid of fighting. Boy, he's a dirty fighter. He would make mistakes. Sometimes, but Wilder knew what and when to do the right thing. He paid very special attention to Jack, not letting him do anything dangerous. Naturally, he had become their boss. Moyo was fine with this since his only purpose was to feed Jack. Marfa was not, but he's one against three. Then that's it. Wilder knew the place he wanted to go. It was a city called Darkmoon. People said it's easy to find food there and climate was warm. Then after a long while, four kids have reached the city. You. No, Wilder turned and declared by the city's gate. I heard this is a good place. So then... We'll be living here since, Jack asked. Anyway, let's go search for some food. Marfa put his hand on his stomach. I'm hungry, okay. Moya agreed. Then, they started hunting for food. Very often they went over to the large garden outside the city, though they got caught every time by an old red-nosed man. They had never got beaten up. Scolded at most, the old man will give them some food when they... Left, however, having fruit daily can be a pretty big deal. When that came, they would go into town and search for fat sheep in order to improve today's meal. Today, Wilder decided to try his luck along with the other three, and he spotted a black-haired kid who looked rich like hell. Wilder wouldn't know that his decision had changed the lives of four and much more in the future. Once there were people showed keen interest in several officers around Cohen's life, there were two generals, a high justice officer, and a chief liaison whose job description remained a secret till today. The two young generals were well-recognized, fine men. One is capable of attacking, like wildfire. His fearsome reputation will shatter any opponent's till. The end of the world, the other one excelled at airtight defense, it had to take any enemy's life to break through. As for the justice officer, he was cunning, second to none. Men or women from corrupted official to local gangsters would flee when he showed up, of course, to speak a few about the last officer. Though he was head of all liaisons under Cohen's command and he seemed boring and lazy day by day, no one knew what's his job. However, when Cohen was planning something big, he'd be there. And if he wasn't, then Cohen would wait. Wait until he showed up. From this, he's also one of the VIPs. Many people think that those four people have made Cohen's career. Without them, Cohen would not be capable of defeating his enemies. They were excellent friends, extremely loyal and cannot be bought off. As Cohen has said, they are friends, that's all. So-called friend, Cohen commented once, they will care. Comfort and help each other with great love and without condition. People who 
Take advantage of their friends are morons. They have lost their precious things. Precious things. Precious things. Colin of the Rebellion, Earth, to 106 DC the night. The night looks so bright reflected by the moonlight. After exhausting myself on a young and attractive body, I'm napping boss. It's time. It's Rat. He's knocking. Due to his unique way of life. Rat has the carefulness that's not processed by ordinary person. I saved him while he was about to be beheaded by another drug dealer. Then he swore his loyalty to me within in six months. He had become the second most powerful person within the gang. I rise up from bed, pull my clothes on, and look back. The white moonlight projects on a woman body, a perfect body, a body left with residue love and sex. I put my second life, a pair of P7 pistol, in the pockets under my arms. Stay here, babe. Hurry, I want more. I smile, open the door and walk downstairs. Rats and other brothers are waiting in the lobby. He rushes to me, boss. Words from the other side. Package is on time and the deal is on schedule. Two more hours and we are ready. I walk out, take a deep beginning of the fall breath and look into sky. Tonight's full moon sheds its magical silver light everywhere. It is mid-autumn, a peaceful day. Let's go. I jump into the van, tell all, kill all and be careful. Let's go too. Nightclub when we're done, you sir. Several bulletproof vans take off and leave the mansion. The guards at the gate are saluting to my van, to them. I am the center of the universe. Now you know what I am. I am a alpha dog, a gang leader. Wait. For it, I am also a secret FBI agent. Gang leader is only a cover-up. On the FBI record file, my name is Wesley. In this seemingly highly developed, but in fact full of dirty crap world. Crimes happen at every corner of the universe. In the meantime, the advancing criminal technique makes it harder for the authority to execute justice. As a result, Dodd Mulhu from the government suggested to fight crime with crime by selecting a team of elite special force and put them undercover. Wesley, a 21 years old sub-lieutenant who got straight as in the strategy and tactics evaluations, hit the jackpot, unfortunately, to rise in rank and travel around the world with pension. Wesley was forced to finish his boring army life early and stepped on a gray path. As for his mission, simple enough, nothing more than vaporizing the target quietly by doing what he can do best within three years. Orders from up top tossed him in many cities. He spent his time chasing those gangsters who are on the FBI hit list. Without exception, those people's evil lives ended under the guns of Wesley and his team. Seeing lives disappearing in front of his eyes makes the innocent Wesley numb and cold, as if those are worthless trash instead of lives that disappeared every time Wesley thinks about his first mission as a gang newbie. That 120 BPM heartbeat makes him feel ridiculous. Nevertheless, for a young man at his 20s, it was not easy as a personnel to execute the law, even though the target is a deserved, disgusting human being, the red and white liquid that came out of the head after he fired his gun and the twitching body in the blood made him throw up and frozen for a week. Unavoidably, Wesley is getting tired of this life. But his boss can't stress enough that those people deserved it. Still, Wesley feels there is blood on his hands, partly because he is not a person who worships violence. However, his lack of ability makes it difficult to distinguish good and evil. There is only one thing he know, that he is a tool, a pretty handy and under-supervised tool. The existence of an overclassified terms and conditions makes Wesley's commander to do what he want with. Nothing to concern, who knows a tool like him is, capable of executing the law or creating new crime. But to Wesley's brothers, he is nothing more than their boss. If one has to say something unique about this boss, he shows excessive passion on killing drug dealer. And of course, Wesley's boss is the commanding officer of the FBI anti-drug department. Before signing that godforsaken document, Wesley thought he can stick to himself in any environments, however, he found himself naive once he truly is spending some time in that environment. 
What he's gone through has made him from a reckless soldier to a completely cold-blooded gang leader. No matter what one carries in mind, in order to survive, he has to change. And precisely because of this change, made him fall, the gang he founded, has a couple of rich business in town, makes their bank account richer as well. For this reason, Wesley somehow starts to like this luxury job. He is capable of doing what he wants. Getting what he wants, it is what it is, Wesley is a leader, and nobody expects a gang leader to do things like a college professor. Boss, we're receiving a third-party transmission. It's the military frequency. Rat turns and says, sounds like cipher. Wesley took the comm rat handed over peacefully, put it in his ears, and overheard a low voice saying, tit, tit, rabbit is out. A while later, another voice came, Roger, carry on. Hearing this, Wesley can't help getting confused. This device can receive any communication within a diameter of 50 kilometers. Isn't there another operation around tonight? Who had this in mind? He took out his phone and dialed an unpleasant number, his boss, the only person who knows his real identity. Thinking of this, Wesley unavoidably shrugged because sometime even himself couldn't tell what his real identity is. Shrieker's office, the call went in and out through several military satellites. A voice that is a little husky and yet soulful came into Wesley's ears. Identity, please. This is your old man, you. Prodigal son, Wesley joked, never cares anything that could irritate anyone. How have you been? Are you closing down that office and join me or what? This is the public channel. And I don't want to remind you again. That voice snorted and asked. Again, problem, no biggie. My men told me there are outsiders doing business on my territory. Wesley put away his arrogant voice, spoke coldly. This is a holiday and I want to spend it in silence. Hold on, a few know on the keyboard. That voice said, the wildlife authority has a team monitoring whales. If they are the outsiders you're talking about. Then I suggest you apply for a license for protection in case I want to break your arm someday. Anytime, you old dog, putting down the phone, Wesley told Rat, irrelevant. In the meantime, in a flying vessel hoving 10,000 meters above, a man with soup put down his phone, thought is through. He told his deputy, tell the fleet. Change the comm frequency to special channel, put the first squad out of the mission and let them talk about whales using the old frequency. Second squad will do the monitoring, keep me posted of their positions. In less than 20 seconds, all kinds of voice are coming out of the speakers in Che Vessel. Armored squad report, tanks and battle vehicles in position, normal air squad report, gunship and transporter in position, normal. Second squad report, we have locked the target, 16 vehicles. 87 personnel analyze shows they have heavy firepower, possibly armed with portable SAMs, and prepared operation, it's truly you. The mid-aged man looked at the roof, not caring the surprised looks from other officers, smiled. I was right choosing you. The vans were parked in the ruins of an abandoned dock. A guy came and opened the door for Wesley. The moment he stepped his foot out of the door, that tired and laid back Wesley was gone. Instead, a cold-blooded, grim look Wesley. The early arriving team had prepared everything. What Wesley saw were men handling weapon and cold faces with excitement. Walking down the dock, he squat and looked through the water with the night viewer handed over by Rat. Bus. Nothing unusual. The deal is on now. On now. Colin of the Rebellion. The bright moon is up high. People are busy working on the dock. There are three yacht parked on the track. Boxes are being carried carefully loaded off. Wesley has found one of his target by the trucks. A fat guy who named himself the king with a bald head and massive belly. Word has it that he loves women. Wesley feels so happy for the women who will about to be sleeping with him in the future. It would not be a pleasant thing being overwhelmed by a body weighs over. 100 kilos, the king is talking with timid-aged guy who look like the supplier. They must be tired of life smuggling patterns in our territory. Rat whispered. 500% benefits will drive anyone crazy. Wesley is a trained agent, and this craziness 
is nothing more than ordinary. He turns his head. Tell them to go in position and wait for my orders. My subordinates take out their weapons and spread out crawling. Then they take up vantage grounds in teams of attack, cover, support formation. Wesley feels very proud looking at all this. These guys are handpicked and trained by Wesley himself. They are equipped with the best weaponry and communications. It will cost average 200 bullets per person per day doing shooting training in the basement. Government is not paying for this, but Wesley consider it worthwhile spending. Rigorous training will lead to amazing outcome, let alone a pack of gangsters. My team will triumph a team of FBI Special Force easily. Rod handed over a rifle. To Wesley, lips pressed. Wesley checked his weapon carefully. Meanwhile, in his ears he heard the sound of other teams testing their communication system. Squad 1 test. Over. Squad 2 copy. Over. When the five squads finished testing, Rad nodded, ready boss. Wesley tightened the recorder on his throat, commands out. All units confirm entry direction. Confirmed. All units entering attack position. Confirm. Confirmed. Covering team position. Confirm. Confirmed. Supporting team position. Confirm. Confirmed. With all that confirmation by their squad leader, Wesley knew they are ready and waiting for his signal, carrying his rifle. Gunstock on his right shoulder firmly, face gently on the cheek pad. Wesley slowly adjusts the aperture until the cross is right focused on the king's fat brain. Numbers on the laser meter changed and stopped at 400 meters. This is the distance for a rifle to yield its maximum destructive power. Everybody who's watching this knew what would be like to be shot by an assault rifle at such a distance. Looking at his twisting face, Wesley knew the king must be thrilled. This much powder. If sold successfully, he could retire at least 10 years earlier. His skin looking good. How does he keep it? Talking to himself, Wesley turned the safe on. Tool he is. He doesn't mind being a unique tool with character. He pulled the trigger. A pretty fire erupted from the other end as soulful gunshot sounds spread. In the silent night, body of the rifle shook lightly. A warm shell fell. In the aperture, blood bursted out from the king's neck. His body shook twice and fell up top at the moment of the firing. All squad leader give the attack command, support. Teams started shooting their semi-auto rifles and the covering team's grenade and smoke bomb exploded into the crowd. Attacking team started assaulting. Team with night viewer rushed into the docking station covered with smoke. After a series of shooting, screaming of the drug dealers could be heard from everywhere. In this standard attack tactics, their counter-strike seemed pretty powerless. Scattered shooting grew weaker. Dying is a matter of time. Jumping out of the covering spot, Wesley crawled towards the dock with Rat following behind. What's left of the drug dealers were countable. Most of them were hiding in a warehouse. Rushing to the door, Rat shouted, Apple. A grenade flied into the warehouse which lead to a series of explosion. Right after the explosion, the team member waited outside travel through the dust sweeping into the warehouse. Anything that moved were targets. Shortly after, a guy wearing a black combat suit made a series shooting, killing the last bad. Luck guy like a bees hive. The sound of shooting piece down. Low and deep groan is all what's left. Report. All units. No targets at loose. No casualties. In the vessel hovering above the sky. What happened on the dock is playing on the monitor. The suited mid-aged man stared at the screen. When he saw that everything's finished, he told his deputy, Commence operation. Roger that, sir. The officer nodded, hesitated, and asked. In the targeted personnel, are there anything or anyone to be held alive or unharmed? The commander paused, then said, no. The officer turned and gave the order. Attention, all units, commencing operation. The order was transformed into shortwaves and spread out in the night like a ripple. It passed through the cold night and moonlight and was received by several special antennas, 5,000 meter in height, Eight gunships turned their lights off and lowered their heads. They formed an attack formation and flied towards the dock. By the fierce sound of the propellers, pilots were observing the ground. 
and guns and rear weapons were on, targets were locked, on the ground, the whole armored detachment switched to power drive, without any sound. Twenty combat vehicles, covered by tanks, were driving, towards the dock from three directions. All soldiers were checking their weaponry and ready to fire, boss. A sound was heard from Wesley's ear. We discovered a hidden tunnel at Warehouse 2, not surprised, he replied with a lowered voice. Clear. It out. I'm on my way. When Wesley came to the warehouse, the tunnel had been cleared. Unexpectedly, this tunnel did not lead to anywhere, but circled deep down for over 10 meters. There was a basement in the end. It is about 100 square meters. Large. After a brief fight, the basement was cleared. What's left was a 40 years old man, and he was being held in front of the boss. He has been struggling while being held. And one of the soldier came and punched him several times then held his hair again toward Wesley. He was a little surprised because this very man is an international most wanted which the FBI has been looking for. This guy is also the king's boss. Whose hat is worth $100 million? His name is Monster Geek. Where are my manners? How could you beat up Mr. 100 million? Wesley stopped the soldier who tried to punch Monster Geek again. He turned and looked at him, smiled. How could you wind up in here? Mr. 100 million, 100 million, Monster Geek spit and raised his head. His face looked very proud. If you let me go, I'll pay you a billion. Do I look like a guy who needs money? Wesley lit up a cigarette hid his true intentions behind the smoke, I'm going to ask you one more time. What is your business down here? What I'm doing cannot be understood by you mindless people. Having said that, Monster Geek realized his current situation, awkwardly added. I, I was doing scientific experiments, you experiments. Wesley kicked his. Sig, feeling damn cold here. Of course it is true. Where do you think I got my name? Monster Geek snorted. I knew you wouldn't believe me. I am an honest man. So I'm going to give you a change. Wesley swung the half-smoked sig in front of. Monster Geek's eyes. In exactly three seconds, I'm going to stick this burning cigarette into your body. I said I was doing experiments. Monster Geek insisted. I have three doctorates. I am studying the secret of life. Wesley threw the cigarette pulled out his gun, loaded the bullets and pointed it on Geek's forehead. 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 Colin of the Rebellion. I, I'm telling the truth. The FBI wants for 100 million for a reason. Because of my work, Wesley is known for his extortive confession skills, even for Monster Geek. He can't help sweating. The reason I'm here today is to receive a prehistorical artifact. I suspect it was of alien origin. It'll help my study. And it is over there on the desk. I created this organization merely to fund my research. One of my people walked towards the desk and fetched a locket. Wesley took a look at the style, put it in his pocket, and coldly looked at Monster Geek. He told the team to leave the room why. You can't kill me. Geek is trembling. I can give you a lot of things. If money is not enough, anything is less than. The harm you've done to this world, Wesley answered. Then he took out a metal cylinder-shaped little thing and put it near Geek's ear, the robotic voice, which has an effective hearing range of 10 centimeters, is speaking coldly, this artifact is held by an FBI agents, according to Act 77945, sentenced death to be carried by the agent immediately, you, Monster Geek looked pale, but turned calm moments after, you are right, I'm a bad guy. But you know, it's always relative between good and bad. Think it through if there's no evil. Justice is not there. Good and evil must coexist. Sorry, I don't like philosophy. Wesley shook his head, pulled the trigger, putting the gun back to the holster. Wesley walked while looking at the locket. Metal. Ancient figure of frame. A crystal in the center. This is science. Or quack. He walked then felt a deep sound of explosion from above. The ground was shaking. Wesley tried steady himself by holding the wall. Boss, we are surrounded. Rat's voice came. It's the Marines, cannons and choppers. We can't hold them for long noise came through the comm. Wesley was stunned. 
He hurried to the ground and saw the dock once again in chaos. Choppers were flying in the sky with incoming missiles. There was fire everywhere. Cannon shells were shooting like rainfall, destroying everything visible. They were being ambushed, confirming to be the military's operation. Wesley looked pale on his face. If the government was turning against him, then his boss must know. And if he is not notified of this, there would be only one reason. Monster Geek's last words came to him. Listen, break it through in teams. Wesley felt hatred. His face turned red and shouted orders loudly. He was clear that with the manpower he had, there were little things they could do. And they were not trained for this. But he can't do nothing. After neutralizing two choppers, three tanks, Wesley, Rat and two more brothers were all that's left. The three men gathered around. Him carefully like it's worth something, regrets. Wesley looked at his brother's bloodstained face, sadly, and said something confused. Regret to follow me, boss. What are you talking about? No regrets. No regrets until death. Don't call. Me, boss. Wesley felt deeply hurt. Sound of gun shooting was coming nearer. He said, I'm not your boss. I'm a cover-up. I'm a government officer, a tool for the government to kill. Surprised though, Rat shook his head and said, We don't care. You will always be our boss. We will not betray you. The other two men said nothing but shaking heads. Is that so? Wesley looked frustrated. Look at outside. Those people. They can't let me go. If I'm right, they are here to kill me. Why aren't? You one of them, not surprisingly, maybe I know too much they want my silence. Boss, let's break out. If death is all it takes, all right, let's go. Let's die like a man. Wesley suddenly felt thousand strength in his heart. Looking at the warehouse, take the rear door. Right after we got out, several tiny cylinder-shaped objects were thrown towards us. Flash bomb, the thought came and gone really fast. They were shot. Wesley felt pain on his leg, then lose balance and fell. He tried to retaliate, got shot again on his shoulder. Pain forced him to let go his rifle. One of the bullets was shot on his chest, blocked that strange locket. Forcing the lock embedded into the skin, stained with blood, when Wesley regained his consciousness, he was surrounded by soldiers. Red and two other brothers were dead, not far from him. A soldier kicked off his rifle, then a familiar figure walked around. It's his supervisor. Wesley, how's your holiday? He seemed to be in good mood. I never thought I'd have to kill you one day. Damn you, do I really have that much of your attention? Wesley could feel life is going away from his body at this very moment. He was filled with rage and regret. You have done enough, time to retire. Your job will be taken over. Is it all my fault? Please don't blame me. Your identity is causing suspicion by other parties. This one is on you. Why can't you keep it low, huh? Those gangsters you killed can be rationalized, but the government official that you assassinated dot dot that I'm unable to explain to my super, I need to keep the internal affair and myself clean. I have to abandon you, you scum, that you order. Indeed, now since you are dying, man in the suit smiled. Today's operation, I lost something too, but it all seemed worth it killing you, worth it, not for me at all. Wesley shook his head, slowly reached a cold object from his left pocket. Press the button on it, at least you shall die with me. The silver metal object fell on the ground, a red dot blinking fast, small as it is. It caused a new round of chose. Air grenade, get out. That's the fi, get out, kill him. Now enough time. Massive explosion occurred. Fire is all around. Several square meter area. Quick could be felt miles away. It's away. Colin of the rebellion. Now we have a breaking news. Last night, at the city's docking station, No.6, which is abandoned. The FBI's anti-drug department has engaged with a large number of drug dealers, parties from both. Fired over 10,000 bullets, Marines suffered great casualties killing all the drug dealers. The massive explosion caused by the last dealer killed 33 people including five senior FBI officers. What you see now on the screen is the center of the explosion.